I, I want to talk a little bit about the time that we're in, where we seem to be going, and what can we do about getting through these very hard years that we as individuals, as communities, as families, as a nation, as a world, are moving through. You know, as a psychiatrist, I, I'm deeply, deeply honored to do the kind of work that I do. It's, you know, all the religions talk about the nobility of the human soul in one way or another. You know? But when you're in a position where you're sitting across from another human being who's telling you about the deepest, most intimate struggles of their life, once you look past all the pain and the suffering and the anguish that people go through, you, you always see the nobility of the human soul, the honesty of people's efforts to try to come up with the right solution, the, the striving to be the best they can be, the, the love that they're trying to, to sacrifice for. So I actually find this work, as, as difficult as it is sometimes, to be tremendously rewarding and affirming of, of, the, of the beauty of, of, of human nature. So having said that, we, we read the newspapers, we watch television, we go online, we see each other's lives and we see, it doesn't always look like that, does it? It looks very, uh, very trying. So I want to talk a little bit about those trials and a way through. And then a, a project that I'm involved in that is um, kind of a way to try to put these principles into action. Okay. Um, as Susan mentioned, I was at Harvard for 17 years. I, I was sentenced to Harvard for 17 years, <laughs> but they let me out on good. Actually, I, I broke out, <laughs> and um, yeah, and they haven't found me yet. So I, so I'm, I've escaped from there a few years ago. But um, one of the things that I did while at Harvard is I, I was running trauma programs for veterans in, in different hospitals, and sometimes for very traumatized individuals, uh, sometimes women who'd been through horrible uh, experiences or children. And through the course of doing this work, to make a very long story short, I wound up working for the State Department, doing training for them when, uh, during the war in Bosnia and Croatia. Remember in the early 90s? They would send clinicians and social workers and community organizers, they'd send them through a, a tunnel, they would actually sneak them through this tunnel, and I've, in subsequent years I've gone through this little tunnel, it's about that big and that wide, runs 300 yards underneath Sarajevo, under what was then occupied Serb Sarajevo, to the airport. They'd, they'd run these people through that tunnel and put them on a U.S. Uh, transport plane and fly them to Germany and then the United States. And then in, when the States, they'd send them to me uh, up in, in Boston. And then I would provide training for them in, in you know, how do you, res how do you respond with what the word we use is resilience to this kind of trauma? You know, how do you, how do you deal with this kind of trauma psychologically and socially? So we did that for a few years. And then the war finally ended and they asked if I would go over there and do that work over in, in Bosnia and Croatia. So I lived over there for a year running programs and what became very, very clear is that there aren't enough psychiatrists or social workers or uh, psychologists, maybe in the world, to handle the need of a place like Bosnia. Right? So the whole idea of a, of a mental health model in a, in a crisis like that, I thought, I don't, I'm not sure that that's the best way to do this. We need another way of viewing in interventions after terrible problems like that. And it seemed to me that we kind of have to flip it on its head. Instead of looking at it as a mental health problem, what if we looked at it as a resilience building problem? Let me, let me give an example about what I mean. So as a physician, if you want to know about health as a doctor, you would absolutely not come to me, right? Because what do I know about health? I'm a doctor, right? Doctors are trained in disease, right? My, all my training is about pathology. And at my best, I can help someone who's diseased be become non-symptomatic. But if you're interested in someone becoming high-functioning, well, I haven't got a clue how to do that. I'm a doctor. We don't, we don't learn how to do that. Right? So I thought, well, and more and more in the health field, you have people who are studying, like Sheila, you know, what is optimal functioning? What, is it, what would it look like to be engaged in helping someone be really healthy? not just symptom-free, 
Does that make sense? So in a similar way, psychologically and spiritually, instead of looking at what are what is the process of relieving mental health symptoms, what would optimum mental health look like? Does that make sense? So the word for that is resilience. That's the word that I'm using to describe that. So I became more and more interested in resilience. What would a really healthy response to this terrible kind of a situation look like? Not just one that gets someone out of trauma, but really makes them thrive in the face of terrible situation. Okay? So, so when 9-11 happened, there's a, there's a group of us in the country that get called when something bad happens. So I got the call from New York City and they asked me, uh, <laughs> it's actually kind of a funny story, a friend of mine called me and said, John, uh, he's a, a friend of mine who does some of my work for me, uh, and after 9-11 he was using some of my models to uh, work in, in the city, and it just so happened that one of the assistant commissioners from a city agency was in his audience, and she asked him to please uh, bring this work to New York, and he said, well, it's not my work, it's a friend of mine's work. So she said, well, have him come down immediately. We have to ha have you guys down. So he called me and he said, John, New York wants us. We have to go down immediately. And I thought, how does New York call you? I mean, so so, I, so I, I didn't even hear what he said. I wasn't even paying attention because I couldn't imagine how New York could call you. So I just kept talking and we hung up the phone and he called me back and said, John, New York's calling us. We have to go down immediately. And I still, I didn't know what he was talking about. We, I kept talking and I hung up the phone. He called me a third time. He said, John, pay attention. Listen, New York is calling. We have to go down there. I said, oh, okay. I, it finally hit me that New York was calling. We had to go down there. So the, the agency was, is called the Department of Youth and Community Development. So it, it takes care of everything to do with kids that isn't in the schools. Right? So all the after-school programs, the work study projects, the uh, mentoring program, all, anything that's not part of the curriculum. So we went down there and I, I said to them, the last thing you should do is turn these kids into mental health patients. Because they said, what, what should we do? Should we have all the kids drawing pictures of, of the buildings coming down? Or should we have them all talking about their feelings? What should we be doing? And I said, don't turn these kids into mental health patients and don't send them to the mental health system. That system's already collapsing. There aren't enough social workers and psychiatrists and psychologists in the, in the state to handle it, so don't turn these kids into patients. Instead, we have to look at them in a, with a broader lens, that they're not mentally ill, but they're struggling with trying to find out what the meaning of this experience is for them. So we ha whenever I say something really important, there'll be a technological <laughs> noise. That means that I've just said something important. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So, or, or a child will cry. That, that, that can happen too. So, I said, our, our lens has to be a little bit broader. And I said, think about it this way. Our brain is wired in such a way that we are kind of two creatures at the same time. As human beings, we're really two things at the same time. On the one hand, we're an animal, and on the other hand, we're, we could be a human being. <laughs> And what I meant by that is that we're wired naturally for survival, right? We have an animal instinct to survive. If we're being threatened in some way, our, our brain is wired to respond to keep us alive, right? You've heard of the fight or flight response? Have you heard of that before? You, you run out into a street and you don't see the car coming and all of a sudden you look up and you see it and you become startled and your heart starts pounding and you jump out of the way before you even think about it, right? Your adrenaline goes way up and then you become either very frightened or very afraid and you jump out of the way. That's the fight or flight response, isn't it? And it, thank God we have it because it keeps us alive when we're being threatened, okay? So that system is excellent for keeping us alive when we're being threatened. And we become very frightened, don't we, when we see that bumper coming at us. And that, that, that fear becomes a lens that colors all of our thinking. Right? So if we become afraid, all of our thinking becomes focused on why we should still be afraid. Right? 
Have you ever seen that when, when you're afraid, maybe uh, when you're watching a scary movie, you're a little bit afraid, every little thing that happens in the movie, you're a little bit jumpy, right? That's why you watch scary movies, actually, right? So, or if you're angry, we were talking about this last night at the fireside. If you're angry, everything the person says who you're talking to is proof of how evil they are, right? Right? Because you're not really interested in understanding the whole picture about what's going on. <laughs> so he just pointed at her. Yeah, I said. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not trying to start anything, I promise. But think about it. When you're angry, that's what happens, isn't it? Everything that the other person says is just proof of how evil they are. And you're not really thinking. You're building a case. Right? Right? You're building a case about how to defeat the enemy. You're not really thinking. So these survival emotions that we have, these instinctual survival emotions, they hijack our brain. And they hijack our thinking. So all we can think about is why we need to continue to be afraid or angry or jealous or greedy, or you see what I'm saying? These survival emotions force us to think in a, in a certain way. So let's take fear and anger. So back to New York City. I said, after this terrible event, you're going to have two general kind of responses to the buildings coming down. On the one hand, there are people who are a little bit more prone to responding out of fear. They're going to wonder you know, is there any good in the world? How could something so horrible happen? How could people be so horrible? And I find in myself so much rage or so much fear that I'm not sure that I can ever be good either. I mean, all I see in myself is fear. Yeah. Or all I see in myself is confusion and, and disillusionment. Right? So without something you can really believe in and, not really, and without really feeling that you have the capacity to move, bless you, to move towards that goal, our willpower becomes weak. Does that make sense? If you don't have a goal you really believe in, or if you don't really feel you have the capacity to reach for the goal, your willpower becomes weak. So I call this constellation a weakened identity. And the main feature of a weakened identity is despair and a weak will. So I said to the people in New York City, on the one hand, the big issue we have to worry about is that we're going to have a lot of kids who don't see any purpose in life, who don't see that there's anything to aspire to, right? And there's no reason for them to try, right? There's no reason for them to, to aspire. That's one problem. And that doesn't show up on a mental health questionnaire because it's not a mental illness. It's something else, isn't it? But that's going to be one of the big problems. The other big problem, it's kind of the mirror image of that, the opposite, and I call it a rigid identity. And for some folks, they tend to respond to things less out of fear and more out of anger. So when something bad happens, they don't think, well, what can I do to change it? They think, what did you do to make this happen? Right? So they're more interested in blame. This happened and it's your fault. Right? So and it, what happens to their identity, it's like imagine you have a roulette table that's your identity. I've never played roulette, but I've seen people play it on TV. So, you know, you put five uh, chips on the, on the red 27, and that's, your, uh, that's maybe your, your, your husband, you know, or you're a, or you're a mother. Or, and you put a couple of chips on being a brother, and a couple more chips on being a Presbyterian, and a few chips on being a Republican, or a Democrat, or a Rotarian, or a, you know, a Girl Scout, whatever it is. You've got all these chips, emotional investments in different identities. Does that make sense? But after something like 9-11, you take all those chips and you put them on the red nine. And now you're a hyper-Democrat. You're a hyper-Republican. You're hyper-American. You're hyper-Jewish, hyper-Baha'i, hyper-Christian, hyper-Muslim, hyper-whatever. And everybody who's not that is evil, right? Do you remember right after 9-11 how tight everybody felt? how united everyone felt, and that lasted for about how long? About like a couple of days, right? And then what happened? We're calling each other traitors, and we're calling each other un-American, and, and, uh, right? And that came right after, and the, the last 10 years has been about finger-pointing, and the extremism, and the excessive partisanship. 
So what I said to the folks in New York City is that what we're going to see after 9-11 is on the one hand this weakened identity with people filled with despair and no motivation. And on the other hand, we're going to have highly motivated, rigid extremists. Right? Have we seen that? Okay. So that's the problem. Because now these rigid identities are going to be beating up on each other or trying to recruit the, des the desperate. Right? And that's not good for democracy, it's not good for community stability, it's not good for, uh, for uh, the growth of anybody. Right? So that's the danger. And they said, well, what do we do? What do we do about that? And I said, well, the, fortunately, there's a third alternative, a third identity. These two identities come instinctually. They come naturally. They come without thinking. We become either fearful or angry, right? And we be either become weakened or rigid in our identity. It happens automatically. It's the way we're wired. But the third identity, I call it a compassionate identity. Right? And it requires a choice. It requires us saying to ourselves, even though I'm afraid or even though I'm angry, I'm going to choose instead to see the compassion in the situation, to see our common humanity, that we all suffer, right? And we all suffered through this terrible event together, right? There is no them, there's only us, right? So I said, what we need to do in the city is we need to teach the kids that these two alternatives are not options, you know? We, we might be afraid, we might be angry, but we have to let go of those things and choose instead this compassionate identity. We're all in this together. And then we need to teach them the skills they need to be able to live in a world like that. Does that make sense? So what we did is we started a project in the city called the Healing Arts Project, using the arts as a way to develop these skills in kids. It was very cool. It was tens of thousands of kids around the city making wraps and, and uh, not, not sandwich wraps, but like wraps <laughs> and uh, uh, hip-hop raps and, and, uh, and murals and dances and uh, uh, songs and poetry all over the city. And we saw that the, the crime rate began to go up in the first months after 9-11, these rigid identities. And then, I don't know if we had anything to do with this or not, but it went down again once our, the Healing Arts Project started going. So we're, we, I'd like to say we could prove that that was the case, but we can't prove that we had anything to do with it. But I like to think we had something to do with that. So anyway, here we are now, 10 years after that time. This coming uh, uh, September 11th is the 10th anniversary of the, the attack on this country. Can you believe 10 years have gone by? And it's been 10 years of fear and extremism. Right? But the kids in the room now, and the kids who've been outside and came here this evening, they didn't have any part in creating that world, but that's the world we're handing to them. That's not fair to them. Right? So what we decided in the city, we wound up doing four cycles of this work, and it's now, we now call it, it's, it's part of my non-for-profit now called the Unity Project. But th this, we're, we've, about a year ago, we, st we created something called Reach Up USA. That's the latest version of this work. And we were thinking, boy, you know, this, is, this project's going to end at the 10th anniversary of 9-11. We need to really focus on that. This is a unique opportunity as a nation for us to reflect on what, where, we're, where are we going? Are, are we going to keep this fear alive? And are we going to keep feeding this extremism? Or are we going to learn this third lesson? You know, make this other choice? So we thought what we would do is that we would seed the city, the whole city of New York, with service projects where young people would be serving each other. right? And they would be doing it to, to demonstrate compassion and cooperation in action. And, and, and as a way to say that they, they, have, they want nothing to do with the fear and extremism of the last 10 years, but instead they're looking to 2021. They're looking to the next decade. Right? And they're not just talking about a, a, a better world, they're actually making it. They're, so these kids who are supposed to be at risk will actually be role models of... Uh, of change, and positive change. So we've already begun, and we've got uh, uh, about 26 sites around the city right now that we've trained and are act in engaged in this process. And a couple of them are Baha'i activities, but 23 of them aren't. And uh, 
what we're expecting is that uh, by July 9th we want to have 50, but we now have 26. So by right around the middle of June, we're expecting the media will start looking at this 10th anniversary of 9-11. And what do you think they're going to be focusing on? The fear and the, the, fear and the destruction and the anger and the extremism, right? And why didn't, didn't you do this? And why didn't they do that? They're going to be doing all that finger pointing. Well, what we want is not just in New York City, but across the country to have these examples of kids saying to the rest of the country, we don't care about the fear and extremism, we're building this other world. And you can join us if you want, but we're not waiting for you. We're building this world, okay? And it's a world of cooperation and compassion. So we want to be able to turn the media to these kids when they start focusing on 9-11 and so that we can actually alter the course of the national discussion, the national debate about what, where are we going for this next 10 years. So that's a project that I'm involved in right now, and you're more than welcome to, be, to participate if you'd like, that we have a, a Facebook page. It's a Reach Up USA. Janet got on it. Were you able to get on it today? Yeah, well, there, there is a Facebook page, Reach Up USA, and right now we're just asking kids to like it so that it doesn't look like a parents are running this thing. But the, uh, it, yeah. Up to 22. Yeah, up to college, yeah. You can easily join, yeah. I'm hoping you will. <laughs> Before you go to China, yeah. So, Twelve to twenty-two. Twelve to twenty-two year olds. We was going to be twelve to eighteen year olds, but all these college kids said, Don't you dare exclude us. And so we I you know, I'm a softie, so I included the college kids too. And uh, and also because it's a real good idea to have role models. Yeah. The, the older they are the better. And yeah. E exactly. And a lot yeah, it, it's so true. And they're beginning to really develop real capacity at that age, and they're very creative, and it, it inspires the high school kids and the junior high kids, yeah. And then once they're past 22, I, I, I figure they can help in other ways. They can, they, can, um, they can act more like the adult supporters of the work. But, but uh, we had to have a cutoff, so we made it at 22. Um, so, but 12 to 22 right now. Uh, younger is okay, but we're, um, we're going to move to the younger ages after September 11th, actually. But anyway, if you're interested, you can go to the, our website, is uh, unityproject.org is our, is our website. But then um, the Facebook page for kids is Reach Up USA, and you just type that in the search line and it'll come up. So I, I wanted to tell you that so I could tell you this, the next thing. How, how are we doing so far? Okay, any, anybody else have a thought about what we've said so far? Now to June, uh, our, our plan is to get as many people on sites like that as possible uh, because we do have a, a media campaign that's building right now. We, we have connections to some uh, producers and agents and things in, in New York City where the, where the major um, uh, media outlets are. So we think we're going to be in pretty good shape. Uh, and if you have your own, your own contacts, please let me know. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's kind of building behind the scenes right now so that, so that um, we're going to flip the switch in June. And, uh, and, uh, and get this to happen. You know, it's so funny because I didn't plan this. I mean, in a way, it, sort of, it just sort of landed in my lap and, and you just sort of, you follow one step after another and boom. And it's sort of t taking on its own life, which is very cool. So, but if you think about the time we're in, you know, it, to, to a Baha'i perspective, this, this is something as a Baha'i. This is not a Baha'i activity, by the way. It, it happens to be, I, I happen to be a Baha'i and I'm inspired by the Baha'i teachings to do this work, but I think anyone who's just paying attention to the world right now wants to do something to reverse 
the kind of destructive forces that we're seeing around us. So there, there are some key principles that I think are helpful to, to keep an eye on right now as we enter some very scary waters um, as a country and as, as a world. Um, the things that are happening in the Middle East right now are wonderful in some ways, but enormously ominous in other ways. That, that we're not, it's not clear where this is headed in Egypt and in other countries or what's going on in Iran. So um, we're entering a time of, of great uncertainty and we have to be careful to, to observe these tendencies to pull us towards fear or anger, pull us towards despair on the one hand or pull us towards rigidity and extremism on the other. These are human tendencies. We all f- have to deal with them. But we all are then faced with a choice to, for this third option, this compassionate option that doesn't close the mind so quickly on pat answers or formulaic answers. So, okay, a couple things. One, one point I wanted to bring up that's been very helpful to me in, in, in my own work is a, a conceptualization of this time in history that the Baha'i writings talk about, where on the, that the world is moving towards its unification, that the, the, the humanity is moving towards an inevitable unity. It's a very perilous path, but we're, that's where this turmoil is headed. And so that on the one hand, we see a kind of a disintegration and a collapsing of systems in the world that are based on principles that just simply don't work anymore. That one race is better than another. One nation is better than another. One religion is better than another. One gender is better than another. Systems that, that have these principles operating in their core are losing credibility and losing capacity to govern. Right? Every, everywhere you look, the, the world seems far less governable in 2011 than it did in 2001. Right? So on the one hand, we see ecological systems, economic systems, security systems, uh, social systems, governance systems, all weakening right? at a time when we need coordinated efforts to solve all of those problems. So limited approaches to solving ecological problems, limited approaches to solving the economic crisis or the uh, 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 um, uh, security issues in in the Middle East, when they're approached in nationalistic ways, we we keep making the problems worse. So we're being dragged into a recognition that we are already a united humanity. We are already intimately interconnected. And we need to develop systems that are equal to uh, to the crises that we face, to the interconnected crises. And that's the other process that's going on. There's an integrating process where institutions are emerging, new levels of awareness are emerging new uh, social movements and and, uh, networks are emerging that are kind of wiping away the the, um, uh, uh, the debris of the collapse of this other order. So in a way, we have to start thinking about where our energies are invested as as individuals. How much of my energy is invested in uh, a system that's collapsing? Or at the very least, if I can't extricate myself from the grid, you know, I, I still need electricity and I still need to eat, you know, what am I doing to help build this other, this other side, right? So I think it, it, it behooves us in this time in history to start thinking about where, where is my contribution? Is there something I can be doing to be facilitating this integrative process? Especially if you've got kids, it becomes more urgent. So having said that, I, and how am I doing on time? What, am I got till 8:30? Keep going. Right. Just look. Just I'll look for the eyes rolling back, and then that'll be the uh, the first one of these, and, and I'll, I'll know it's time. Um, okay. Now I've, I I could open up something that'll take me an hour to lay out. So I'll 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 see if I can do it fast. There are there are five basic areas I'd like to just offer as areas of resilience that if you have these five areas, if you're working on these five areas of your life, your life will start to work better. Your, your response to the struggles that you face in life will become 
uh, uh, more manageable. You, you're, you'll be more adept at dealing with the, the, the struggles that you face. The first is, I, I call them five R's. The first three have to do with our judgment. Right? And the first one is, re, I call it reflectivity. Right? What I mean by that, remember we talked about how uh, after a crisis, after any kind of stress in our lives, we're pulled towards either despair and kind of collapsing in on ourselves, or we're, we're pulled towards anger and rigidity, right? And dominance, right? The first step is to be aware of that and reflect on where in your life that's taken hold. Is it happening in your relationship, your intimate relationship with your spouse, with your kids, at work? You know, how, how are those tendencies creeping into your thinking? Right? And, and, okay. So being able to reflect on that and to develop practices that help you let go of that right? and so that you consciously choose a more compassionate, dispassionate approach to the world right? so, we're, so that our thinking and our hearts aren't governed by responses to loss. Does that make sense? Reflexive responses to suffering. Does that make sense? Does it? Okay. That's the first R. The second one is, I call it reframing. And it's like, here I have my teacup. I first have to empty it. So the, the first step is R, reflectivity, emptying myself of my biases. Right? That's another way to think about my, my responses that are fear-based or anger-based. They're, they're kind of emotional biases, emotional habits. In the Baha'i writings, I think these are related to a, called two different things, vain imaginings and blind imitation. Has Baha'is read those words before? And you, you often thought, well, what, does the, what do those words mean? I think that's what they mean. I think a, a, a vain imagining or an idle fancy, a fancy is an emotion, isn't it? And it's, and it's an idle fancy if it doesn't get you anywhere, right? So one way to look at it, it's an emotion that doesn't really do you any good, right? It's not that emotions are bad, but they don't, some of them don't get you anywhere, right? Anger doesn't get you anywhere good. Fear doesn't get you anywhere good, right? So one way to think about reflectivity is that what emotions are sabotaging my happiness, right? That, I, I, that I've evolved into a habit and I think they're inevitable and necessary. And we live in a culture that says, you should just feel whatever you feel. And you're being honest when you, are, when you rage at someone when you're angry at them. Right. Can I give you an example? And I know this is running out of time. But I, uh, I ran a trauma clinic at a VA hospital once, and the veterans don't come to the VA. They don't like the VA because it's too bureaucratic. So a friend of mine and I were running this trauma clinic and uh, we, we had lots of people we were helping, but we thought, you know, the, really, the guys who really need our help are never going to come here. Well, where are they? They're homeless. Let's go find the homeless guys. So we literally walked down the streets and we found homeless guys and we brought them into the clinic. And after we did that for a while, we said, well, you know, there's a new homeless shelter in downtown Boston. Let's go there. So we went there and they threw us out because they didn't want anything to do with the VA. There was a couple of vets who took this building over in downtown Boston, it was like of the Wild West. They blackmailed the city of Boston into giving them this building. Uh, they sort of shamed them in the press that uh, they needed this building. And they ran it like, a, it was really the Wild and Woolly West. So when we showed up and said, hey, we're, we'd like to help, they, they, they just kept throwing us out. Every week we'd go, and every week they'd throw us out. And they did that for a year. So in the second year, they finally said, okay, all right, we'll let you in, but if you mess up, we're trained killers, and you're in trouble. So, <laughs> so, so we thought, okay, our careers are either beginning or ending now. So, so anyway, so we set up this thing, and uh, uh, one of the there was a woman who was there. She's a very beautiful social worker. So they let her in right away, uh, and she was doing some counseling with some of the vets, and she had taken the vault of the bank and lined it with with pads. You know, with you know, padding, and you know what a bataka bat is? I think Susan, we were talking about this yesterday. A bataka bat is a is like a wiffle bat with padding all around it, or or there might be bataka uh, mitts, and they're like big boxing gloves with padding that big. And the idea is to just get out all your anger and your feelings, just beat up stuff, right? And there's some people who think this is a good idea for therapy, 
So what she used to do is she'd get these veterans in the, in the vault and give them the bataka bats and the big mitts, and she said, just go at it. Just let all that anger out. And so they'd rage and they'd beat on things. And then at the end, she thought she'd done a lot of good. And so I said, well, let me just understand this. You think that people are faucets. Human beings are plumbing systems, and that if they build up too much pressure, if you just let the pressure out, that, that fixes it. She said, yeah, that's kind of it. I said, okay, well, what if we're not faucets? What if we're not plumbing systems? What if you've trained that, that trained killer, you've trained him that whenever he has a serious issue, that of all the feelings he can have, he should be angry. And of all the anger he should have, he should be rageful. Right? So of all the feelings he could have, he should only be rageful. And then of all the behaviors he could then have, he should only be violent. Right? So basically what you've done is you've taken a man with serious issues and you've trained him that whenever he's got a serious issue, he should be full of rage and violent. Right? So that's another way to look at it. <laughs> so the thing is, is when we're angry or when we're fearful, we think that's, there's no choice involved. That's who we are, where we have to be honest with ourselves. And what we do is we destroy every supportive relationship we have. We, we find ourselves to be more hopeless and more filled with rage and despair. It's a dead end. It doesn't get us where we want to go. First step, reflect on fear and anger and recognize that there's a choice. The second R is reframe. That you have to reframe your situation. It's, more, it's bigger than what you think it is. It's not just as simple as black and white, right? Baha'u'llah says this in a wonderful way. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, he says, the essence of all we have revealed unto thee is justice. It's interesting. And then how he defines justice. And then he defines it in this way. He says, is for man to turn away from idle fancy and blind imitation. Kind of what I just said. Turn away from these kinds of emotions and blindly imitating behaviors and ways of thinking that you've always assumed were right. Just because you've assumed it your whole life doesn't mean it's correct or helpful anymore. He says that's the first thing you have to do. And that's what I mean by the first R, reflect. And then he says, see with the eye of oneness his glorious handiwork. So it's not as simple as just seeing that this person's evil or that person's trying to hurt you. Maybe it's much more complicated than that. Maybe it's much more benign than that. Maybe Maybe there are many more options for you than you think. See with the eye of oneness, Baha'u'llah says, his glorious handiwork. And don't be afraid. Don't bring your fear into the situation. Don't bring your anger into the situation. See with the eye of oneness. And then he says, and then look into all things with a searching eye, which is the third art, and I call it reassessment. So from this new perspective where you've calmed your emotions down and you're seeing with a larger eye, now look at the problem with a new eye, right? So first, empty the cup of all the stuff you've got in it. If you want to put clear water in there, get all the dirty stuff out of there first. Right? And then look at your problem with the, in this new context. Does that make sense? Those are the first three R's. Because then you can use the fourth R, which is, I call it responsibility, where you, you, you no longer see that your life is being controlled by something outside of you. This is one of the great psychological and spiritual catastrophes is when we think that our life is is being run by something outside of us. I can never get ahead in the world because someone's always sabotaging my happiness. Or I can never make my life work because this happened to me in the past. There are these forces out here that prevent me from being happy. So part of our maturity, our growth as human beings, uh, 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 moving from childhood to adulthood, is developing a sense of responsibility that... Basically, we do have a choice. And it's a wonderful and terrifying realization, right? Because if we have a choice, oh my God, we have a choice. But oh my God, we have a choice. So it's a little of both, isn't it? But that's, that's what mature adulthood's about, is recognizing that responsibility, right? But then we can act, and I kind of have three and a half R's here, or the four and a half, there's a little bit more, there are more R's than five. The responsibility leads to resolve, right? We, we can then work with intention and we can, mean, we, can, we can move towards goals in our lives without feeling the drag of our fear and our anger. Does that make sense? 
for the fifth R, and that's relationship. And it's listed fifth, but it really is the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Uh, re- it's all about relationship. We are, we are nurtured and bo- we're born into relationship. We're nurtured through relationship to the end of creating relationship. Business happens in flourishing relationships. Uh, families thrive in reciprocal relationships. Right? So that's the end towards which we can direct our will. It's towards nurturing relationships. When we're fearful or angry, we're not interested in nurturing relationships. We're, inter- we're interested in survival. Right? So as we move into the darker heart of a very dark time in history, the pull is going to be more and more towards fear and anger. Right? So we have to be aware of that and consciously choosing, yes, I'm afraid, yes, this is, I'm angered by this, but I'm going to let it go and I'm going to choose compassion and a larger view. I'm not going to let my heart and my mind become small. This is what we're after with Reach Up. What we're doing, this, this program, with these kids around the city of New York and then what we're doing around the country is we want kids to get engaged in service to other kids. And the, the service acts like an excavator. Right? One of the things Baha'u'llah says too is that each of us is like a, a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. Isn't that a great way to say this? That we're, we're all filled with wonderful potential, right? So the average kid doesn't know that they're a mine rich in gems, you know? We might walk right by a mountain and not understand that there's a, a vein of diamonds in it, right? So first you have to know that there are diamonds in that, that hill, right? And then you, know how to, you have to know how to get those diamonds out, right? So we use service in the arts, but as a way to bring out those gems. And then once they're out, then we need to refine them. And we have a, a transformation process of very fun exercises we bring things, we, we, uh, we help kids with it, where they learn more about these skills. If you ask the average kid what their skills are, what their gems are, there's actually studies on this, you get four words for the average 12-year-old. If you ask them to, to define their strengths, tell me what your strengths are. They'll say, I'm nice, I'm funny, I'm smart, I'm cool. That's it. And then if, now if you want that kid to like act as an adult, they've only got four weak tools to act like an adult. Right? But we're expecting them to act like adults and they don't have any tools for it. They don't know that they have skills. Right? So we, we yell at the kid, Johnny, be patient. You know? And so the example we set is of a, it was an irritated, impatient person telling the kid to be patient, right? And so, you know, there's not a match. So then we wonder why the kids don't act with, with adult strengths. It's because it's not being modeled and they don't, they don't get it. So what we're doing in, in the Unity Project and Reach Up is we're showing kids a process that, to build these strengths. We bring out the, 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 the gem, we have them experience it, then we have them name it. Actually, for teachers, this is a good thing to know in class. Um, we have them experience patience or experience uh, uh, um, uh, creativity or experience um, uh, perseverance or, or experience solving a problem creatively. Let's just say those things. Then we, we help them with language to describe what they just experienced so that the experience and the language matches. It's not, would you be nice to your sister, as you say it angrily, right? But, but the experience and the language matches so the so the experience and the word match. Then we help them see its value. And this is where a lot of edu- moral education falls down, is that we teach moral education the same way we teach history. But moral education is an experiential learning where you have to see it role modeled, you have to weigh it, you have to, you have to go through a, a thought process. So you have to see it's, you know, it's better, to, why is it better to be nice to my sister than to yank my, my toy out of her hand? You know, I'm not quite sure, I don't see the benefit of waiting. So you have to help kids think that through. Then the fourth thing is they're more likely to choose to act that way, right? That's choose and act. So we we have these transformation exercises where we help kids rehearse these strengths one after another so that after a, a series of service projects, they've learned a whole series of skills they need to be successful human beings, right? 
So that's what we want presented to the country in July, is kids all over the country doing this. We can do it with the kids here in Tampa. That'd be wonderful to get the Baha'i community here or, or the schools in the area. You're more than welcome. Get the media down here to, to show these kids changing the world.